Hey everyone, welcome back. And if you've, uh, you, we're done with the first half of Hybrid Cloud and Edge Day for 2023. I'm one of your hosts, Jeff Mruschak, senior SA on our DoD Air Force team. My co-host, Adrian. Hey folks, my name is Adrian San Miguel. I'm a principal partner, enterprise architect here at AWS, and unlike Jeff, not in the DoD space. And so you've probably, if you've been paying attention, you've been seeing there's some motifs and general ideas. We're talking a lot about latency, about bringing uh, products and services closer to customers, mm -hmm. uh, both AWS customers and our customers' customers. So that's been very interesting. And you had teased right before we're going to change gears a little bit. Yeah. And we've been talking about the edge, but also some IoT. And we're going to go into a little bit IoT focused here. And uh, up next, we have a really cool video. It's an immersive demo of this automate, automotive um, lab, AWS Automotive Lab in San Jose. And it's interesting. We've been harping a little bit on machine learning. We're going to mm -hmm. dabble in some IoT. And Working with a lot of IoT folks, I always joke that the IoT folks should be good friends with the machine learning folks mm -hmm. because we're setting up the data. We're getting the data and sending it to the machine learning folks so they can do their inferencing and everything. So yeah. there's there's always good uh, relationships to be had there. Yeah, it's a great uh, great analogy. I've always, my, I've always pictured it is it's a dance. The IoT devices are going to be generating tons of data. We're shipping it off to you. Let's learn from it so we can do things better together. And make business decisions off of that. Data. Exactly. Don't focus on the tech. The tech's going to be there. You can use whatever. What is the primary business outcome that you're driving? Yeah. That is really what we're after. So everyone, check out this video again an immersive demo of this automotive data automotive data journey we're going to cut to this video we're going to take a quick break for lunch and we'll be back with Chani and your favorite and mine rudy chetty to Can't wait. look at this awesome remote control deep racer car with some extra things on it so i think oh. we might need to update the chassis a bit there's a ton of stuff on there so tune into this video and we'll see you after lunch Welcome to Hybrid Cloud and Edge Day. My name is Victoria Siman. I'm a senior developer advocate at AWS. And today I'm at the Automotive Lab in Santa Clara, where we're going to learn about automotive data journey and how to use AWS services to build and run applications in the cloud and at the edge. I'm joined today by Jeremy Dahan, who is a subject matter expert at the automotive space. Jeremy, Tell me a little bit, like, what's going on here? Hi, Victoria. Very nice to have you here. Hi, everyone. So here we're in our Santa Clara lab. We have a show floor with a lot of prototypes that we're going to walk you through after that. The first thing we're going to start is all of that data needs to be captured from the vehicles. So the first thing we're going to do is get outside in our vehicle and collect some data. Let's go outside. I see those cables coming from cameras. What's going on here? Yeah, thanks, Victoria. So what we have in that vehicle is on the roof rack, we have a few sensors, so cameras for now and then GPS. Later, we're going to be adding more. But to your point, we actually need to collect all of the data in the trunk of the vehicle. So let's have a look. Let's see. Wow, lots of gadgets here. Yes. Tell me more about this. Yeah, sure. So the idea is that this is a typical setup that an automotive car maker, a tier one supplier would actually have in the trunk of the vehicle. The idea is that you want to collect all of the data with high accuracy. So we have first power management system to distribute 12 volt and 110 in the trunk of the vehicle. Okay, so this is power management. And then what is this big device? Yeah, this is the heart of the system, a D-Space Otera Logger that basically gets the data from every single sensor you have in the vehicle with different automotive interfaces. So in this example, we have camera interface, CAN that all of your vehicles have. We collect the data right from the steering wheel column, the OBD2 port, um, basically from the front. And all of the data gets captured locally on the SSDs. So you can have up to two times 32 terabytes on that system. Oh, that's quite a lot, like 64 terabytes of data? Yeah, it is actually. The reason is that this device can collect data at the speed of up to 50 gigabits per second. If you were to have like 10 cameras plus four lighters, then you generate a lot of data. Hmm, interesting. And I see this is another storage device, right? Yes. So depending on the use case, some people may, uh, may want to upload the data themselves, then it would collect it basically on the DSpace or SSD, and then they have the corresponding upload station. Or if you want, you can go on the AWS Marketplace, order your Seagate drive. This one is the live mobile array that is up to 92 terabytes of storage, and this is pure storage. 
Okay, so you have 60. Four, yeah. 64 terabytes here of data collected, then you have 92 terabytes here, and I see snow cone. Yes. That's additional storage. Okay, yes. Why? And compute, exactly. So the idea is that depending on the use case, you may go for just the storage on the DSpace logger. Or if you actually are collecting data and you want to ship it around, you can actually ship that stuff with a pilling in case, and you have a lot of data. Or you may actually have just one camera. I mean, and maybe an ultrasonic sensor. And in that case, you have low bandwidth, snow cone makes a lot of sense, it's 14 terabytes of storage, and you also have compute. You can use the compute to do some pre-processing of the data, such as checking that the format and the sensors were actually uh, recording data. Interesting, and I see you have modems, so you are also sending this data to the cloud? Yeah, exactly, so the idea is a typical setup the car maker would go for a complete shift, eight hour drive, they would basically collect all of the data, but according to the industry, five to 10% of it is really relevant. The rest of it, you may be willing to discard it. So the question now is that either a better way to shorten the time from the acquisition of data in the vehicle to the time an engineer can work with it. So we have Stu Chow that I want to introduce you to you from the automotive, um, IoT automotive, he's a software developer. Thank you, Stu. Hey, nice Victoria, nice to meet you. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Stu. I'm a senior software developer for AWS IoT Automotive. So today I'm very excited to introduce our newly launched service, AWS IoT Fleetwise. So we, when we start this new service development two years ago, when we look at the auto industry, there are several challenges for the, uh, for the auto industry. One is the data fragmentation, one is the data locking of data standardization and also with more and more technologies going into the car, the amount of data has been tremendously growing. Oh, I can see all of the storage devices here. Right, and this is only for one car. And Fleetwise is meant for production vehicles, which means for millions of vehicles on the street. So that's a big challenge. That's why we invent Fleetwise to help the automaker to collect data and also transfer, transform data in a cost-effective manner. So how does it work? So basically Fleetwise has two components. One is sitting on the AWS cloud and the other is a C++ application running on almost any Linux embedded system. So where does it run here? So today, in this particular car, the Fleetwise Edge agent is running on the DSpace Autora data logger. Okay, so you have this Edge component running here, and then what happens? So you use modem to push data to the cloud? Right. So let me talk about the workflow, a typical workflow of using Fleetwise. So starting from the cloud, the customer can define a data collection campaign. Because as Jeremy previously mentioned, only five to 10% of the data are high value data to, to the automaker. So you don't really need to collect all the data at all the time. So using, by using the Fleetwise data collection campaign, you can specify, I want to collect those signals when this particular event happened, such as a heartbreak event, or when your vehicle is in certain geo location. So once the, the user creates a data collection campaign, uh, you can deploy this data collection campaign through Fleetwise Cloud to Fleetwise Edge sitting on a device. And between the cloud and edge, we are using the MQTT protocol. And uh, the modem here essentially is the, the providing the cellular connectivity between, uh, the, between the edge and the cloud. Okay, so um, help me to understand. So you store here terabytes of data. How much data do you actually push to the cloud? Well, so for Fleetwise, we are really focused on the high value data. Okay. So it will be a small amount of data compared to what's storing in the hard drive here. But however, uh, as Jeremy previously mentioned, it may take days for automaker to analyze all the data from the original storage. But however, using Fleetwise, you can access data in real time. So you can see there is a high value event happening right now 
in the car. Oh, interesting. So I noticed you have over there a monitor. So does it show real-time data or what's happening yes. there? So that monitor, uh, essentially for this test car, we installed a monitor in the back seat so that we can, uh, it helps the, the troubleshooting during the test drive. Um, this, what's showing on that uh, screen, essentially is what's going on in the Fleetwise Edge agent. We're showing that it's decoding the vehicle network, uh, determining whether there is a event that are interested to customer, and also, if so, upload the data to AWS Cloud. So what are we going to do with this 95% data that sits here? Well, I think that's well, Jeremy will come into play. How do we do it? So what we can do is we can open the rack mount, and I can basically grab the drive, and oh, now wow. this is ready to go. Exactly, you can ship it in a Pelican case. Stu, so you said IoT Fleetwise is collecting data in real time and sending to AWS Cloud. So how can we see this data? All right, so today I'm gonna show you that uh, uh, we will have different uh, flows of uh, uh, collecting data and also visualizing data on AWS Cloud. So the first scenario here, which, which is actually exactly what we just demonstrated in the vehicle, is that we put the Fleetwise Edge inside the this space author data logger, and this author data logger is collecting data from the vehicle, mm -hmm. and then data will run through the MQTT, uh, MQTT protocol, through the AWS IoT core, through the Fleetwise, and then ultimately the data will be stored under the customer AWS account. Okay, so you're using AWS IoT core to ingest data. Right. Uh, into Fleetwise and then it will be on a AWS account. And it looks like there are several paths to store data. I see you have TimeStream, which is time series database, right. and um, Amazon S3. So can you tell me a little bit more uh, why would you use TimeStream versus S3? What's the decision there? Right, so when we first launched the Fleetwise service back in September 2022, uh, we are really focused on real-time data analytics uh, application. That's why we start our service with uh, TimeStream. So essentially TimeStream allow you to access the time series data in a very convenient manner. Now, uh, later on when we uh, having uh, lots of customer engagement, we do see a strong demand of having a uh, customer to build their own data lake. That's why we recently introduced uh, AWS S3 as a data destination for, for Fleetwise uh, data collection campaign. Uh, this was launched in uh, June this year. Okay, so you have some real-time data or let's say more, more recent data in time stream and you can visualize it using Grafana um, in more for like a historical purpose I would right. imagine like right. ar archival, maybe even use Amazon Glacier for right. older data, right? You can then keep it in S3 and right. then this way make it like more cost efficient. Cost efficient. And also if you don't really need a real time uh, analytics, if you want to do batch processing on big data, the S3 certainly will be a better choice. In today's, uh, today's uh, demo, the, we already set up the data collection campaign and the data destination is the time stream. So okay. today we won't be able to show the, the vehicle data on S3. I'm going to show you the, the time stream data first and then I will show you the Grafana because the Grafana essentially is visualizing the data in time stream. So here in the time stream, you can go to the query editor and then you can essentially write a SQL-like query. And uh, for example, I want to query uh, from this particular time stream database. You specify the time. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at the, the last one days, but of course we can look, you can, for example, I can change it to the last uh, two hours. And then you specify the vehicle name, the measure name, which is the signal name, mm -hmm. and then the campaign name. And uh, uh, if I run the query, you will see that 
it basically will return the uh, in just like when we did the the, the the test drive a moment ago from this vehicle uh, I'm looking at the vehicle autometer yeah and uh, it is uh, nine this is in kilometer so nine thousand uh, seven hundred kilometer so mm -hmm. you can see it has the dimensions such as the campaign name vehicle name uh, signal name timestamp and you can also attach other attribute to to the those uh, signals okay so this is basically how we organize the data in time stream so now if i go to the grafana i have a very simple uh, dashboard which is uh let me show the last uh, the three hours okay so if I zoom in into this part, this is a very simple dashboard because I'm showing that this is the odometer. This is the four tire pressures. They are in uh, K Pascal, but if you convert them to the PSI, it's about 30 PSI. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see the, uh, the air temperature is about around 28 degrees C. So this data is coming in real time? In and real you, time, right. And if, what's the frequency of data being collected? So that's actually specified in the data collection campaign. You can specify uh, like a time-based campaign where you say collect data every 10 seconds. 10 seconds. 10 seconds, right. So, so here you can see the throttle position here and uh, the air temperature because we're not driving, that's why we don't really see any throttle here. And uh, so this is just a very basic visualization of what's coming from that car. Uh, in the next step, I will show you a more sophisticated diagram. But one more question. So while the car is just standing by itself in the garage, are you also collecting the data? No, when the engine is off, we are not collecting data. Okay, so there is some kind of a, right. you can set up conditions so you don't collect right, data right. when you really don't need to collect it. Right, right. So in this, in this case, for today's demo, I actually have uh, uh, two campaigns deployed to the, to the vehicle. One is a, we call it a heartbeat, but this is really up to user to define the campaign. But essentially here, we define one uh, campaign, which is, uh, basically collecting those 14 signals and uh, simply collect them every, uh, every 10 seconds. And so just I'm trying to understand, so campaign basically means that it's a certain time duration window right. that you outline and you select which signals you want to collect, collect and how right. frequent. Right. Is it right? Yes. Okay. And here you can see this is actually a very interesting campaign is that we, we basically trigger whenever you have a, your throttle position goes, to, goes beyond 50%, then it will trigger this data collection, which will capture the GPS signals, throttle positions, the adaptive cruise control and the, uh, the driver uh, throttle override. So it's more, event-based versus right. just the frequency. Yes, so the user has all the options. They can collect, they can define their own campaign and they can define up to 20 campaigns for per, per one account. Okay, so let's go back to the architecture diagram that you were showing. Right. I noticed there were a few more things. Um, so can you explain me about the different paths here? Yeah, so because in reality, when the, when the, when the user uh, trying out Fleetwise, and they may not have the Fleetwise running on hundreds of thousands of vehicles. That's why we want to provide a simulator for customer to experience the, the, this uh, Fleetwise on large quantity of vehicles. So next, I will just basically show you, show you how we make this happen. So essentially, we are leveraging the, the ECS, AWS ECS, which stands for Elastic Container Service. And each of the tasks 
is running a one edge agent instance. So basically each task represents a car? A car, right, exactly. So imagine you have, have thousands of tasks running under this ECS uh, cluster, and then in this way, you are simulating thousands of vehicles without the actual physical objects. And why would you need to do that? Why would you need to simulate this data? Well, so sometimes the customer may want to verify their campaign actually works before they deploy it to the real car. Okay. So they want to verify the, the data collection system works, right, before, because once you deploy them to the real car, you need to pay for the data usage. And, uh, and if, the, if the campaign doesn't work out, then it simply uh, may become a pretty large cost. So that's why by using the simulation, you can basically uh, make sure you have the right campaign before you deploy. Basically, we, we built this uh, dashboard to focus on the EV uh, battery management system. So you can see here that uh, uh, we have essentially the different battery modules. Mm -hmm. And then we are actually using colors to highlight what's normal and what's not normal. So for example, here you can see the, uh, this is under the simulation, but we basically simulate that the module two is overheating, um, the module 10 is overheating and over voltage. And uh, also the cooling system is actually not even running, even though when you have an overheating problem. So this is basically showing that um, this is actually in one of the problematic vehicles that in the simulation. But essentially, uh, imagine in the real scenario, right, in the real world, this can be happen in the production car, right? So basically by using the fleetwise, you can have a cost effective way to monitor the, the, the battery status on the EV. Okay, so we, you mentioned about simulating right. thousands of cars. Right. And then what are you going to do with all of this um, data that's being simulated? So first of all, we, uh, what we are gonna do with those data is to verify your data analytics system, right, works. We build this uh, uh, EV management solution on the cloud now, when you have the real vehicles, real production vehicles, it should be portable. The same solution will work the same for the production vehicle. So basically you develop the system on the cloud and then you deploy to the production vehicles. Okay, and what do you present here? So here we're basically presenting how to manage the EV, uh, EV fleet in a cost-effective manner. So here, for example, we flagged certain vehicles is reporting unhealthy, battery mm -hmm. unhealthy, and then this. So you have a thousand vehicles total, 997 right. of them are fine, right? right? right. And three vehicles are problematic. Right, and then those three vehicles, the reason why they are reporting problem, problem is because the battery state of health is too low. And then we basically do a deep inspection onto those three cars. And this is the one of that car. And basically we are showing the dashboard to, to see which battery, which battery module is not functioning. So now I understand about collecting data in real time from a car, right. simulating data. Can you tell me about this path here? Right, so, so this path is like a hybrid uh, setup between uh, the in-vehicle data collection and the cloud-based vehicle simulator. So, so here we actually have the, the, the real hardware uh, for example, we will, I will show you one from NXP, this is S32G, one from the iWave, this is a TCU, and uh, we are using a Intrepid data logger to play back a test drive. Essentially, this is simulating a vehicle, but however, you are using the actual hardware 
to, to, to collect data. So this, this way you have a more realistic validation on your, on your data collection system. So you collected the data and then you are able to connect this device and play back to the cloud? To that's the what, cloud, right. That's what happened, right. okay. So it's kind of like a hybrid approach between the first two. Yes, <laughs> right, right. Very interesting. Right, so I can just quickly show you on the, uh, the dashboard. So, so here, what we are showing here is by using the Fleetwise, you identify the issue in your BMS system. Now, after you apply the fix to the BMS system, uh, you can use Fleetwise to validate your solution on the, uh, by, by using the hardware in loop testing. So it's here you can see um, the yellow line is showing the cooling status. The green line is the battery cell temperature. So you can see clearly that by running this test, now when the battery cell is over a certain threshold, the cooling system will be activated accordingly. So basically by using Fleetwise, you can validate your BMS fix actually works. That in, it's working, that it's car. been activated, activated as it's supposed to. Right. Still, thank you so much for explaining the automotive data journey. But we talked only about this 5% data that actually gets to the cloud. So what's going to happen with this extra 95% data that we still have raw? Well, Jeremy can help you with that. Absolutely. So let's go to the server room to upload the data to output. Amazing, let's do it. So Jeremy, you've been carrying this thing uh, for quite some time. Let me try it. Oh my God, it's actually quite heavy. It uh, is. So tell me, what are we going to do now? So the idea is that all of the data that we collected from the vehicle is stored on that specific data. We're going to insert it into the upload station, which is right there where there's an empty slot. So when we actually insert it, then Outpost is going to be able to detect it, and then we're going to run some pre-processing of that data. So our upload station will upload it to Outpost or? So you can go two ways. You could either go straight to AWS, upload directly from the upload station, or if you want to do, you remember we said that there's only 5 to 10% of the data that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. So Stu said Fleetwise is one way, but there's still more compute that you can actually run locally, so then you may want to leverage the GPU basically based in Outpost. So you have SageMaker where you have trained a model for detecting, let's say, pedestrians or vehicles, and you can actually run it locally on the data that you just collected. So you can pre-process some data and then push it to the cloud so you don't uh, send all the data to the cloud. Yeah, exactly. So this way you're going to limit the amount of bandwidth you're going to need to basically go all the way up to AWS. Okay. And you mentioned, um, so GPU, uh, Outpost has GPU, so you can also deploy machine learning? Absolutely. So the idea now is that on AWS, I'm going to run with SageMaker my training of the model, and eventually I can get it deployed on Outpost. We're going to show it to you later. So running SageMaker on Outpost, uh -huh. It just opens, I feel like, so many different possibilities in terms of what customers can do. Absolutely. So here we have a use case for automotive, but that could be applied to any other industry. Actually, Outpost is used by NASDAQ to basically run the most demanding workload for the data exchange that they have. Then you have also for the gamers, Riot Games, that want to provide best-in-class experience for the um, gamers. They basically run also on Outpost. And the last one would be Toyota that basically has started modernization of their application. They want to have low latency so they can leverage Outpost. Okay, so anywhere where we need a low latency and we don't want to send data to a cloud, that's where customers will benefit from Outpost? Absolutely. Another use case would be for data residency. Then for legal reason, you may not have the ability to get your data to the cloud. So then you can keep the data locally, but still benefit from the AWS services. So how can customers get outposts? Yes. Actually, you go on the AWS console, you can order your outposts. They come in different form and different shapes. So you have the racks that are like full racks you can see right there. You also have the server that is like one to two units. You order it, it gets installed at your location, and then this is a managed service, but it also includes the hardware. So it gets delivered to your place, it gets installed, and then you get the benefit to just use it. 
And so you use the servers, but like, it's not the same as your buying server, right? Like what's the main difference between getting an outpost and just buying servers? So the huge difference is that here it comes with the maintenance, so you run the exact same EC2 and S3, like if that would run on AWS. So now if you have an administration of different pipelines, going back to the automotive industry, I'm collecting data from all over the world. I have some location where I have my own on-prem, but I have some places where I do not. So now I can have a hybrid model where I have some AWS outpost where I'm gonna do pre-processing and I deploy exactly the same pipeline on AWS. So it's a seamless experience. That's like the data that you collected from the vehicle. Now I'm gonna put it into the rack mount and the data is gonna to start to be uploaded. The first step, it's gonna to start to blink white, which means that it is decrypting the data. The data is always encrypted, so just in case somebody would have access to the device, they would not have no access to the data. And how long is it going to be decryption for? Yeah, so it's like the process itself is maximum two minutes. Once it is done, then it's gonna go for a steel green. And then what happened? What will happen after? Yeah, so you have two things you could do. Either you can upload the data straight to AWS, that is what that system is doing now when it's mm -hmm. squirreling, data is actually being uploaded. Or if you want to pre-process the data, you can actually have access to outpost. And on outpost, you can run an inference engine, for instance. So you said 92 terabytes. It's going to take some time to upload data, right? How do I know when the data is uploaded to the cloud? Yeah, so to speed up the upload, you can use AWS Direct Connect, where you can go all the way up to 100 gigabits per second. And once the upload is being done, then it's going to blink in another color, saying that it's ready to be used by somebody else. And what if I want to just start using it locally? Yes. So if you want to use it locally, the thing you could do is just copy it onto the Seagate uh, local uh, data lake that they have. In this example, we have 1.5 petabytes of storage. This is also accessible from Outpost. So if you want to minimize the time that those arrays stay in the server room, you want to do a straight copy from here to the data lake, then you want to basically run the inference from Outpost and then go to AWS. Oh, so once the data is copied locally, I can start running machine learning right here, right? Exactly. Right, I mean, from basically to minimize the latency, now you have access to your servers and AWS services locally. Yeah, so you have data, you have a local GPU instance, and you can uh, do a lot of things. Yeah, exactly. We're going to show you something where we did a training of a model leveraging SageMaker, which we eventually deploy on that local system. I would like to learn more. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get to show you how we did it. So I think the best way to learn is by doing. So let's get hands on and let's do some things on the console. Awesome. Thanks, Victor. So here, this is a SageMaker, basically a studio. That is the very first time you some of our jumpstart uh, where you have pretend models. Or in our case, we're going to show you how we've deployed basically on the outpost. So I'm going to first go into our pipelines. We have established a pipeline that you're going to see in a minute. It's very visual what that pipeline is doing. So it's a very standard model that we're deploying. So the idea is that you want to pre-process the image. That means that you want to make sure all of them are of the right size. You don't have any outliers. Pre-processing can happen from the local data, right? So it can be either cloud data or the local data on yes. the outpost. Yeah, exactly. In this specific example, we have the full training done directly on AWS. Okay. And the outpost is just running the inference. Then the model gets trained. Then the model, we evaluate if it got better or not. Uh, the performance is improving. Then we would actually upload that model. Upload that model in this example is very specific. So typically, on SageMaker, you're going to basically run that model and deploy it onto S3. And then you can actually have an inference point that would be running on AWS. But in our case, we want to run it on Outpost. So what we'll do is we will actually deploy that model directly on Outpost. So anytime you ingest new data, you will actually run the latest model. And then upload will happen on S3 on Outpost. Exactly. Yeah, you got it directly right, which means AWS services run on AWS Cloud, and then AWS Outpost is your local AWS services. So same story, you have S3, and then your script can actually get the latest model from there. So the customers can work with services, AWS services on Outpost the same way as they would have worked on 
AWS Cloud. Exactly, this is very transparent. One thing I want to uh, let you know is we said that let's uh, basically get um, hands on and I can show you where we will actually connect directly to Outpost. So I'm going to run that. Now what I'm doing is I'm connected to the Outpost, which is just local right there, okay? Um, I'm going to go into our inference loop and I'm going to do a command that activates PyTorch because that actually is the model that was uh, trained on. Mm -hmm. And now all we need to do is to run our model. So I need to just run that command, run the inference on the GPU. Okay. What that is going to do is it's actually going to look at all of the data that is local and then start to do all the inferences. That's why now you actually see images oh. by images, the annotation being done. As a result of it, basically you have images like that, where you made a detection, in our case, of pedestrians and vehicles. You can go and detect anything that you want. You leverage basically SageMaker. So this is going to significantly reduce the time of uh, processing those images, right, rather than uploading them to the cloud and then analyzing and evaluating, you looking at the images that are stored directly in Outpost? Yes, the main idea is that if you think about it with the amount of data that you're collecting, you cannot upload all of that on the same day, I mean, except if you're using like several direct connects. So you want to minimize the amount of data you will collect. So that's why you will actually run the inference at the edge in that example. This was such an exciting example. I would like to learn more. What are other use cases in automotive where you would implement machine learning? So another example would be weather prediction. So you literally have to predict the entire globe and then you have to make the prediction for how the weather is going to look like. So an example of one of our partner is Vesela who are providing prediction. You can say, hey, I have seen a lot of companies doing weather prediction. What is unique about Vesela is that they provide road weather information. So what are all of those dots? So all of the dots are either data points that were collected by Vesela with some sensor that they would have on the road, such as this one. So the idea is that this actually is something that you will literally drill and put in the ground, and that will actually make measurements of the temperature of the road and the water thickness or ice that you would have there. But to get something like this, you would need to have like millions of those devices. Yes, exactly. So the idea is that they, you don't have millions of those. That's why, thanks to SageMaker, you can actually make prediction of them. So basically, each of these data points is either one of the sensors I've shown to you, or there is also a run-run for instance, DOT or fleet management that would have sensors embedded on the vehicles. Or publicly, BMW Nissan will actually be working and leveraging data from the seller. So you are saying that instead of me installing millions of these devices, I can actually use machine learning and predict some of the parameters? Absolutely. So the idea now is if you know the road composition, you can actually do that and you can predict a lot of the parameters. So one of them that would be very interesting, for instance, is the coefficient friction of the road. So one example would be for ADAS, driver assistance system. So when you're coming up a pass or basically specific hard situations, you want to let the driver know in advance, hey, you're coming up to a point where the coefficient of friction is very low, so you may want to reduce your speed. Okay, anything else that user would, like regular driver would benefit from this information besides road conditions. Yeah, so the other information about the EV range estimate is that now if you actually have an electric vehicle, if you have heated seat on the back seat, it's very likely because heating your seat consumes a lot less energy than actually turning on your HVAC in, the, in your system. So you're telling me next time I feel really, really hot, instead of putting all the way AC up, I just need to cool down my seat? Absolutely. <laughs> now cool down or basically get it heated. Yes. I'm sorry, but I have a few more questions. Sure. Maybe we can do a whiteboard and then you can explain better the data path that we followed. So we started with Seagate device, right? Absolutely. We brought it in. Yes. So we brought the Seagate device, which actually was the mobile array which is 92 terabytes of data, okay? This was inside the vehicle. Then all of the data got copied onto it. Then the idea now is we want to get it to AWS. So we can do a first thing, we get to the upload station, which was in the server room. Up, upload station. We insert the cartridge in, and then we can go straight to AWS if we want to. Okay. So 
the upload station is going to upload AWS cloud, but you also showed me the local device. Absolutely. So Seagate is providing also a local data lake that has a storage of 1.5 petabytes capacity. So this is 1.5 petabytes. Where the idea is the following. When you actually record the data, you want the data, I mean, from that system to stay in a minimal amount of time in the server room. So to get it back on the field, you would do a quick copy on that storage. And from there, now you can decide if you want to upload to AWS Cloud or just keep it there. Exactly. One thing that you could do, so if we upload to AWS, we can actually use something like Direct Connect. So we could actually go all the way up to 100 gigabits per second. Or if you want to do some pre-processing as we're showcasing, you could use Outpost. So Outpost, if I oversimplify it, up, Outpost has CPU, GPU, and local storage, okay? This is like running the same as on AWS. So then I can pre-process some data on Outpost and only send data that I need to the cloud, right? So in this way, I will minimize how much data I'm sending to the cloud. Exactly, so now we can actually take that path, go onto the GPU, run a model that we're gonna train on SageMaker, and the data that is relevant would end up on S3, okay? Oh, that's very interesting. So another system that we had was from DSpace. So we can actually have a parallel path where we start with DSpace. That's a device that we saw in the car, the very one on the bottom, right? Exactly. So that one, each of those devices can go all the way up to 32 terabytes of data. And now you can go to an upload station so same story from this space. And from that upload station, you could either go straight to AWS to S3, or if you want, you can also run some local processing. Or if you want, you could also copy the data locally and eventually run the inference model or any other pre-processing. It doesn't have to necessarily be just an inference model you run on there. But then if you run pre-processing, like where would you run? Pre oh, you would actually run it on Outpost. On so Outpost, you so can you have to use Outpost. Exactly, so the upload station itself could upload to AWS by itself, or you can actually, the upload station would basically get the data onto the local site from Seagate, and then you will run exactly the same pipeline. This is very visual, I like the visualization part, so thank you so much for walking me through this.